Valley Wall, and, um, and I work uh, with Better Linux and during the last years primarily Android for for many years basically. Uh -huh. So I've doing Better Linux since 2001. Yes, it's true. So today uh, we're going to talk about allocators for compressed data for compressed pages within Linux kernel and what these things are about and what they're needed for. So um, before we actually pass over to the allocators, uh, I'm going to take a step back and start with uh, the main users of those allocators that the uh, swapping or paging uh, techniques, uh, swapping or paging implementations uh, there in the Linux kernel, and uh, the optimizations to these techniques. So first of all, swapping. I guess I guess uh, I will not spend more time necessary on this. Uh, you all probably know that this is a special technique uh, to use secondary storage uh, to save on RAM by pushing uh, the, the pages that are not really used or have not been used for a significant while off the RAM to the secondary storage. And we basically trade memory size, trade memory free area uh, of performance because uh, you know, reading and writing uh, pages can be quite slow uh, with a slow storage device but still, if we need more RAM uh, for our applications to run, that can be the only way out. Um, with that said, if we want to do some performance optimizations, and this is what we want to do pretty much always, and this is what I want to do because I work in the performance area for the last, um, well, I'm not working with the power. Uh, so what do we do? to optimize swapping uh, with respect to the performance. Uh, we're going to use RAM, or we're going to try to use RAM to cache the pages that are being swapped out to minimize the I.O. operations, uh, especially when the backup device is slow. Uh, but if we do it straightforward, in a straightforward way, uh, then probably we're going to lose the main benefit of swapping as such uh, that, that the uh, saving RAM for, for the real users for the real uh, memory consuming applications that we couldn't run otherwise so if we have this cache and it's too big and if there's no real saving then probably it just wasn't worth it I mean the whole mess just didn't make any sense Thank you, that's right. Yeah, never mind. Let's see how it goes. Um, so, uh, then, the idea comes uh, to compress the pages that are being swapped out. They're not going to be used uh, by a system, because system thinks that they're actually off the RAM. Uh, so we can compress them uh, and keep them compressed either until we have too many of them so that we can actually uh, push them to the storage or if the system decides that it needs those pages well, it can ask for those pages and we decompress them on demand What's important here to mention is that the compressed chunks will be less than page size. Their size will be less than page size. And uh, conventional allocators, they, they do not work with that. They only allocate uh, pages. So we cannot really make use uh, of the fact that we have data blocks, that we have data objects less than page size if we're going to allocate page for each such object. 
So, and then uh, comes such a thing as an impressed memory allocator, which, well, allocates memory. Uh, but the key thing is that such allocator is designed uh, to be able to store small data objects, less than a page. And then we get the real benefit uh, from the pages being addressed. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, this is the question. I, I, I saw that many people tell me that I do not really uh, communicate well to the audience. And at some point I accepted it, uh, so I'm talking to an imaginary audience. And this is the question that an imaginary audience is going to ask. Uh, yeah, like it. So, uh, is compressed memory allocator just a tool to store small data chunks? And, well, at the bird fly level, the answer is yes. Uh, and now, uh, let's come a little closer to the initial subject. Uh, with that the compressed data, data algorithms and how they're used. And we're going to talk a little bit about swapping and compression um, and the way they are implemented in the kernel. And the first uh, swapping compression uh, implementation is called Z-swap. It's the first historically and in terms of uh, frequency of use. Uh, in, in Linux, in different situation, and that is a write back swap cache, uh, which allows for compression. So what it does uh, is exactly what we've been talking about uh, a few slides back. It compresses uh, pages that are swapped out and move those pages into a pool, and when the pool is full enough it pushes uh, those pages, it uncompresses the pages and pushes them uh, to a storage device and then when they are needed, they are uh, loaded directly from the storage device so in a sense it's transparent to the swapping uh, mechanism of the Linux kernel and then we come even closer to the initial subject and, and we are going to take the allocator for Zswap, which initially was Zswap, and this allocator is also because it stores either one or two pages, uh, either one or two objects per its own page, and those objects are called bodies, so there are two bodies for one body in a page, uh, one in the beginning right after the header, and one in the end. And uh, if we're going to take the Z operation a little bit more detailed, then we should say that it divides the page into same size chunks. And then it places a header in the first chunk, and all the rest are available for the bodies. And then it creates uh, unbodied lists. So for, for each possible uh, number of free chunks. No, tak, tak, there is an unbudded list. Uh, with that number of chunks, with, with all the objects, with all the pages that jo. have exactly tak that number of free tak, chunks. Jo. So if uh, we want jo. to tak allocate se, tak se uh, an object jo. of tak a store of an object that requires n free chunks, we take the first jo. one of the relevant list. Yes. If this list is empty, no. we take the next no. one, no. L and plus no. one, no. and so on. No. If everything no. is empty, no. we only no. take no. the page. No. So, no. No. Uh, that is not. Came as an alternative to Zbug, and uh, it addresses the biggest problem of Zbug, and that is the actual compression ratio being uh, the amount of pages stored divided by amount of pages used can be quite low, especially uh, if we stumble upon the situation 
when there are many pages of size around 2K, I mean, not the initial ones, but the compressed ones, the compressed objects uh, which are sized around 2K, 2K plus delta, uh, they are bad for ZBot because you cannot store two such objects into one ZBot page. Uh, so there is a lot of space uh, left free in such ZBot pages, so the actual compression ratio can be quite close to one. And ZS Malloc uh, allows for contiguous allocation of objects within physically and contiguous pages, uh, which gives very high compression ratio, especially in the beginning. Uh, the deficiency of that approach is that, well, you know, there will be calls as times go by, so there will be released objects that will create multiple holes within uh, the ZS Malloc pages. So ZS Malloc uh, is exposed to the internal fragmentation, which is very complicated to mitigate. And, well, it's making it especially more complicated, you know, the fact that objects may span across several physical pages. So, if we can come up with an alternative uh, that is better uh, compression ratio-wise than ZBot and do not have uh, to distribute objects across several pages so that every object ends at the page boundary, then we may be actually better off. Uh, and this is something that we'll be discussing in the future and further on. Uh, but as of now, uh, as a side note, we need to mention uh, that after we uh, got two compressed allocators, uh, which did pretty much the same thing in a completely different way, uh, that actually called for unification because that's what could be, I mean, it should have been easy to configure ZSwap to use either ZBot or ZS Mallet uh, depending on the actual system demands. So, depending on what is actually better, uh, you should be able to choose between ZBot uh, or ZS Mallet. And it is a lot more complicated when they have incompatible APIs. So, well, that call for unification and the new API has been introduced called ZTool uh, and both ZS Malloc uh, and ZBot implemented that API uh, and that's what was changed to use that API and not directly call uh, ZBot's API functions. So, it's only a matter of changing the name uh, of the back end of a compressed allocator now for ZS, for ZS swap to actually uh, proceed uh, with uh, the compressed allocator that fits you best. Okay, now we get the question from the imaginary audience. What happened next? That's a good question because then came Zebra which is, to a certain point, a lot more relevant uh, to what we do here, because this is embedded conference, and ZRAM is actually something that was targeting embedded devices in the first place, uh, because it's a self-contained uh, self uh, block device, self-contained storage, that doesn't need Packing storage uh, on a disk or flash, so you can use it directly uh, for swapping because it also compresses pages. Uh, and this is an exact match to embedded devices with small RAM because you free up RAM by putting unused pages into the Z RAM device. So they occupy less space because they are compressed, 
and at the same time you don't deal uh, with related devices flash storage which is usually slow so you don't slow down the operation of an embedded device and you don't cause uh, extra wear out of the flash which you usually cannot change on an embedded device because it's well embedded and uh, I'm, it's all good, it's all great uh, but the only small problem that Zedron didn't exactly play by the rules uh, and it didn't really use the Zedcool API from the beginning uh, and as opposed to that it calls it as another function correctly so if for Zedswap uh, almost from the beginning it's been like you choose what fits you best for Zedron you can only use Zedron's mallet and inherit all the problems that Zedron's mallet has well, together with all the good things of course but still um, so what we did first and there was a presentation uh, in San Diego in 2016 about uh, the results of using uh, ZRAM over ZTool and then comparing ZBug and ZSMALIC as backends for ZRAM. Uh, so that was presented uh, in 2016 in San Diego. Um, and, well, uh, I would just probably refer to, to that presentation because uh, the slides are up there on the net. Uh, but, um, you know, the bottom line was that it was worth a try and in sometimes, in most cases, especially for small devices, uh, for uh, not that big number of threads uh, dealing with uh, ZRAM, you know, dealing with small pain, uh, ZBUD actually operated better, smoother and faster. But with that said, it still wasn't a real match for an embedded device because the compression ratio was quite low compared to the one achieved with the mallet. And with the compression ratio of about 1.5x, it just isn't worth it. Uh, you know, all the stuff, all the mess just isn't worth it. There are not that much actual savings. Uh, so. It was a nice thing to try, but it didn't work out that well. Yeah, and here we have a graph showing pretty much the same thing that uh, ZS Mallet is actually better scalable, but in terms of uh, the I.O. operation, it takes off slowly and that pull takes off quite fast. So if you have a really constrained system, well, it could be actually good to use that pool for something that works like that pool, but is slightly better compression wise. And now, the imaginary audience goes on to the next question. What if we modify ZBug to call three objects per page instead of two? And that is an excellent question because this is what we did. So Z3 fold, the new kid on the block. Yeah, well, this is the 80s, 90s Google. But anyway, Z3 fold created as a spin-off from ZBug, uh, with the only exception that it didn't have its own API from the very beginning. It only implemented Z tool API. Well, other than that, three objects per page instead of two. And it could handle page size allocations uh, as opposed to ZBug, which stores header in the first chunk. So if the object to, to be allocated is of a page size, then it would just sell into a view. We don't do that with Z3 fold. We create a headless page instead. Uh, and yeah, it's a new kid. The work has been started after ELC 2016. 
and uh, the first version came into the main line at 4.8. And yeah, provided that ZRAM works uh, via the Z pool interface and does not directly communicate with ZS Meta as it is now, Z3 pool turns out to be an okay match for both ZRAM and ZSwap. Because it also provides no latency operation and good compression ratio, which is nice for an embedded device. Uh, and it supports eviction because it was inherited from Z-Pool, uh, while z s -Mode doesn't. So it's a better match for z -Swap. and once again, it has a higher compression ratio than z -Mode. so for z -Swap, it's actually also a match. But then we go to the updated uh, applicability metrics. And yeah, I mean, if we just take the existing mainline frame. <coughs> we cannot use either z or z 3 fold with ZRAM once again because it's working uh, with ZS pod directly and does not use the relevant generic API, which is not very nice. But we're not going to concentrate on the bad things and concentrate on the good thing and making them even better. Uh, so we pass over to the fun part. Comparisons. Uh, and the first thing to look at is how we do compress objects under stress load. Uh, given that the work with the first version of that threefold, <coughs> which came in at the version of kernel 4.8. So, what we see here, well, you can see that ZBot is way, way below. We can see that ZS mount starts off pretty well, well above 3.5, sometimes even closer to 4. Uh, but then, it doesn't seem to stabilize, right? I mean, it, it goes on in waves. While Z3 fold seems to be quite stable, uh, circulating around 2.5, 2.6, 2 2.7. And then we go to the random read write achieved by multiple file rand RW tests. And here we can see that, well, ZS mallet is definitely superior when it comes to many threads, but ZBot and Z3Fold are somewhat better uh, when the amount of threads is low, but they don't seem to scale well. Uh, with that being said, they behave in a very similar way, which is not much of a surprise, given that Z3Fold inherited a lot of code from ZBot. So it inherited the behavior too. Uh, the thing is, however, that we were aiming to have uh, performance which wasn't inferior to ZS mallet. So we thought this situation was not acceptable. And we started profiling Z3 fold. Uh, making stress on the two following patterns. The first one is using perf while running FIO, a very nice uh, testing tool, uh, giving stress load uh, and creating different kinds of uh, IO patterns for block devices. And this was used to identify bottlenecks on the stress load primarily. And also we were looking into how z 3 fold operation affects user experience and that was uh, achieved by looking into perf results uh, while Android LMK was triggered which normally causes 
uh, a lot of page swapping. So, uh, yeah. And what was the result of the profiling? Well, you know, not much of a surprise. The main bottleneck was the big screen lock, which is protecting all the embodied lists. So all the embodied lists are protected by one and the same spin lock, and this, of course, does not scale well. Well, in fact, it doesn't scale at all. Uh, the next thing to optimize, another thing to look into, was identified as uh, the set threefold free function, because uh, there was an internal page layout optimization after all the all and every object free operation. And here's why. So, uh, if you can see, I guess you can, uh, the, first, the first graph, the first picture uh, out there, which is on the top, uh, shows a full, that threefold page, uh, because the first object is there, uh, which is like reddish, the second is there, and the third is also there. So then, if we free the first object, then we end up in a situation where we have two uh, free spaces within the page. So we have an internal fragmentation, which however is easy to fix. We move the read logic to the beginning, and then we have contiguous free space that we can use in a better way than two uh, spaces out there on the middle one. Uh, but it's a relatively costly operation to do it uh, in the free function because it may slow down things uh, lying on the hot path. So the idea became there to uh, implement asynchronous handling of such situations. But first came the idea of uh, using per page locks. So we can, or we should, or we cannot avoid having the big lock still, but we can limit its usage uh, to only uh, protect the list operations, while the operations which are internal to the page can be protected by in-page spin lock. So we ended up having a lot of spin locks. And then we have a graph which looks like this. Where the lighter line is for the new updated Z threefold implementation. So unfortunately, it didn't help that much. Then came the async page compaction. And it came into the main line later, or basically very recently. And the idea there is, as I've said, we just take the compaction of the Z3 fold free and schedule it. And then we're taking it off the hot path, that's one thing. And the other thing is that we may save time on compaction if several objects are freed at the same or almost at the same time, because we do it just once instead of doing it every time after an object is released. Oh yeah, we do. We obviously need some extra improvement. Yeah. Right. Okay. Then came the idea of locus lists. To implement a body lists using locus lists. Because, well, we're fighting with the spin lock. Can I do it like this? And the thing is that um, processing is a threefold allocation could be a lot simpler with LS and a lot faster, but the problem is that deleting 
uh, an entry from an embedded list would be a lot more complicated because there's no analog for list delete or list double function in L lists and if we want to simulate it one way or another we're going to end up using some mutual exclusion mechanisms anyway. So, for embedded lists, it just didn't work. That doesn't mean uh, that uh, at some point we'll not return to the idea of using a list for something else, or some other list within the implementation. But for the embedded lists, unfortunately, it wasn't a match. And then, came the idea of per CPU embodied lists. Um, and here's why. Uh, as with the Zenbot, basically, we only need one entry in the list LM. So for every list uh, within uh, the group of embodied lists, we only need one entry to take because we always take the first one. So as long as we can maintain this on every CPU, we can limit the search to the local CPU and save time and also kill the need to have the spin lock because we only deal with the local data. So then disabling preemption temporarily is just okay. We don't have to spin lock. So, yeah, we implemented this. Uh, we had an idea uh, to check if it had an adverse effect on the compression ratio because, well, selection could still get worse. And this came in into 414RC1. So you can try it out and see how it works for you. But for us, it actually worked quite okay. Quite okay. So, the, the darkest line is the user free form. We lost a little bit uh, on the operation speed when the number of threads is not that big due to more resources spent uh, on maintaining the first few lists, obviously. But the scalability increased a lot. So that free fold evolution is with front. RW, well, we increased the scalability at no such big cost, and then we're going to compare it with the two other rivals, the older kids, and well, we can see that apart from a small number of threads, the performance of that free fold is actually better than the one of the two others. So we're there at least partially. And then again, we need to check the compression ratio if it got worse or not. And uh, yeah, the darker <coughs> line is the new one. Uh, the lighter line is the old one. We don't see that much difference. We're happy. We can jump to conclusions. Um, and yeah, the conclusion is, first of all, I'm going to be bold and say that Z3 Fold delivers. It has better performance than this mallet. It has comparable, well, worse, but not so much worse compression ratio. Uh, uh, it has better real-time capability. And it's a good fit for both Z4 and z -Ram. We still need to do some more optimizations, of course. Uh, for instance, uh, with the introduction of per CPU embodied lists, the header uh, of the Z3 fold, which we put into a chunk, in the first chunk uh, of a page, it actually became bigger than one chunk, and now occupies two chunks normally. Uh, so maybe it makes sense to look into the ways of how to optimize the header so that it fits into one chunk again. The other thing to do is to uh, try making the default pages movable uh, to reduce the 
fragmentation within the kernel, which is external to Z3 fold, so it's not the internal fragmentation that is uh, fought against by the Z3 fold compaction, it's the external fragmentation uh, that kernel compaction uh, should be mitigating, but it can't because the pages are not movable. So we need to think how to make them movable in the best way. Uh, but anyway, I believe for a thing that exists in the main line for a year, it's quite a bit of a progress. Uh, and with that said, I want to thank uh, people uh, who helped me with that revolt one way or the other. So the first credit goes to Seth Jennings, who implemented that bot, which I used heavily. Then Dan Friedman, who provided tons of commands which were always very valuable and basically he was the one who helped that default take off and run. Uh, and yeah, I want to thank one of the students uh, that I have an honor to mentor. Uh, he ran a lot of performance and latency measurements and was always helpful uh, uh, pinpointing the things that we needed to optimize. Uh, I would also like to thank my wife uh, who provided a comfortable environment for me to work uh, and maybe even my dog because some of the optimization ideas uh, came when I was walking with him. Uh, and of course I want to thank you all for, for listening and for your attention and I think we still have some time for questions so I really want to uh, hear some questions and answer questions from you, so please. Yes, please. In the early slides, you said that the C1 was pushing compact mechanics out to storage, but you say that you should help compress it and push it through. It decompresses and pushes. So, so, that, that, so, so it's, it's transparent to the system, uh, to, to the swapping system. Uh, the swapping system does not uh, expect uh, to have a compressed page uh, on a disk, right? Uh, yeah, if, if, if there is a typo, I'll fix it. Thank you. Any other questions, please? Uh, well, well, uh, you, you know, um, I know, I know people, people report problems uh, uh, running with Zswap every now and then because there are many servers, many configurations. Uh, for for the ZRAM one, I mean, the, the one that is the in, in the fourteen RC. <coughs> Uh, it's not really used in any commercial product. Uh, the one uh, that, that was in 4.12 uh, and, and the one that was in 4.8, I think they're, they're used uh, in, in several mobile devices which are selling quite well in the market. Sorry? Well, the system does not crash. Okay. <laughs> I mean, Android doesn't crash due, due to Z3 fault, so it's, it's good enough. I mean, uh, the ZRAM over uh, Z4 over <coughs> Z3 fault uh, is very well tested. Uh, the the Z, Z swap uh, over Z4 over Z3 fault uh, may, uh, may still have some problems. We're working on it. Okay. Please. How does the three fold behave when we have eight compression? We don't care. It's okay. No, no, we don't, we don't have slots. We don't have slots. Uh, there is 
Uh, that's actually a very good question, thank you. We don't have slots as such. Uh, we, we bound uh, the, the first page, uh, the first object, we, we bound to the beginning, which is right after uh, the header. Uh, then then, then we, we bound the, the last, the third object to the end. And the middle object should start uh, after the first object ends. The next chunk should be occupied by the third one. But this is not strictly a requirement. Uh, it's how the compaction works. Uh, but there, there are no requirements as to uh, on, on, on the size. There are no requirements on the size of any chunk of any object that we we are allocating memory for. So it, it can be one third. It can be one chunk. It can it can be many chunks. It can be uh, forty. You know, can be a three key plus. <coughs> yes, it can never be worse than zero. Uh, in a theoretical situation, when uh, all all the objects are slightly bigger than two k, it will have the same problem as zero. But in real life, we have never ever come across this scenario. Because the, and, and then the flexibility is better for that free fall. So, so usually there are there are objects there are objects that compress in a bad way that do not compress well, and there are objects that compress in a very good way. Uh, so uh, in in the real life, uh, we pretty much always ended up with one big badly compressed object plus two small ones. Does it answer your question? Yeah. Welcome. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. You're very welcome to, to ask me about this stuff now. <coughs> Thanks again.